Hi there everyone, my name is Zach and welcome to my channel. Amongst other things, I'm a reenactor and a jouster and today I want to talk to you about the Battle of Agincourt. Now if you've been with me for a while, if you've been subscribed for all of this time, then you'll know that a while ago I did a video talking about bows and uh, um, bows aren't really my speciality. So uh, after a lot of people got uh, um, confused with what I was trying to say, I did make that video non-public. Um, just because it was difficult trying to explain myself. So I'm going to stay well away from bows today, you'll be pleased to know. That's definitely a topic that I want to come back to in future, uh, but I am going to need to do that as a collaboration with someone and I probably need to script out what I'm trying to say to make sure that I come across correctly and I, uh, um, I make my arguments clear. Um, now, this particular choice of topic was chosen by my patrons. Um, I did a little poll over there, so if you want to help me choose the direction that the channel is going in, then you can head over there um, and make some choices and see what's going on behind the scenes and uh, all of that sort of thing. But here is the topic at hand. Now, when I, uh, one of the things that I've been talking to a lot with my friends is about how Agincourt has been used so much over the past, um, over the past uh, 500 years, uh, longer even, um, 600 years or so, as a kind of a propaganda piece. And it's been used pretty much almost as soon as it happened as that, as this idea that um, British people, if they are, um, if they're out there and if they've got their back against the wall, they're just gonna win against anyone. It doesn't matter who. And you can see how that would be a really useful thing um, for the British government, for people to use to spur British people on to fight against um, difficult odds. An example of this, straight away, uh, we see um, when England is facing the threat of Catholicism from the outside, the Spanish Armada and things like that, um, we start seeing plays being put on about the Battle of Agincourt. Um, then later on in history, you know, uh, when we get to the Second World War, we see Agincourt, the play Henry V being turned into the into a film by Laurence Olivier with money from the British government because they want the British people to um, to watch something where, you know, just ordinary Brits come together and they manage to beat, um, beat the extremely well-equipped European bad guys uh, just with help, uh, just by basically following the lead of their, um, of their leaders. You can see why this story is so unbelievably useful for um, for British uh, British soldiers, for British leaders particularly, uh, in inspiring Brits to think, "Oh yeah, come on, guys, we can we can do this. We can just win this. Uh, we can win this hands down. It's easy." Um, so I thought it would be good to go back to the original sources rather than trying to read something that someone has written on it. Uh, so when I was researching this, I found this account uh, called, uh, this is written by Enguerrand de Monstrelet. My French is incredibly poor, so if that's mispronounced, I apologize. He died in 1453 and he was the governor of Cambrai and a supporter of the French crown. So we can see that this guy is very unlikely to actually be on the English side and uh, um, he's, very, he's much more likely to say something um, detrimental to the English, in fact. And that's a good balance to have. One thing we need to bear in mind when we're looking at these sources is that they're not written as historical accounts, they're written as political pieces. And we can tell that because they're really boring. Um, if you follow the link in the description down below, then you will find that actually this original account is really boring because he keeps on just stopping halfway through and listing the people that were there. 
and this is kind of like, you know, it's name checking. It, these things aren't trying to be a balanced historical account of everything that happens. It is a political account of who was there, who supported who, and who did well, and things like that. And so we need to bear that in mind when we're reading things like this. They are not trying to produce a balanced account. That that doesn't make sense to a um, to a medieval chronicler. But this was an interesting point because you may remember from hearing the story of Agincourt that partway through the battle, Henry V is worried that he has too many prisoners and that that is going to cause a problem. So he orders for the prisoners to be executed. Now, for us, this is a terrible thing. The idea of... Um, killing prisoners of war is a really bad thing. We don't like it at all. And so, you know, it's something that if we're saying Henry V is a great king, great leader, we've got a problem with uh, in our modern mindset. But this, this really intrigued me when I was reading this because that doesn't seem to be the opinion of the medieval chroniclers. And you would imagine that this... Engelrand or whoever, however you pronounce it, you would think that he would seize upon anything to make Henry out to be the bad guy. But listen to this, I'm going to read it to you um, with poor pronunciation um, as it goes. During the heat of the combat, when the English had gained the upper hand and made several prisoners, news was brought to King Henry that the French were attacking his rear and had already captured the greater part of his baggage and sumpter horses. This was indeed true, for Robinet de Bourneville, Riffard de Clamas, Isambert d'Agincourt and some other men-at-arms with about 600 peasants had fallen upon and taken a great part of the king's baggage and a number of horses while the guard was occupied in the battle. This distressed the king very much, for he saw that though the French army had been routed, they were collecting on different parts of the plain in large bodies and he was afraid that they would renew the battle. He therefore caused instant proclamation to be made by sound of trumpet, that everyone should put his prisoners to death to prevent them from aiding the enemy, should the combat be renewed. This caused an instantaneous and general massacre of the French prisoners occasioned by the disgraceful conduct of Robinet de Bourneville, Isambard de Agincourt and the others, who were afterwards punished for it and imprisoned a very long time by Duke John of Burgundy. Notwithstanding, they had made a present to the Count of Chalois of a most precious sword, ornamented with diamonds, that had belonged to the King of England. They had taken this sword with other rich jewels from King Henry's baggage, and had made this present that, in case they should at any time be called to an account for what they had done, the Count might stand their friend. Okay, so that's, uh, that's actually a translation by... Thomas John, translated in uh, 1840, I read. Uh, it's really interesting, isn't it? The French chronicler does not blame Henry for this. Uh, and in fact, the people of the time um, don't seem to blame Henry for it. It seems to me that they are saying this is a perfectly logical course of action and the people to blame are actually the French knights that started raiding the baggage train. In fact, it says that they were punished for this. So the, the blame for the prisoners being executed, it does not fall with Henry, it falls with the French prisoners. This is, um, sorry, the French nobles raiding the baggage train. This is really interesting to me because it, it doesn't match up with our modern mindset at all. The idea that these guys are blamed, that they're punished. It's not Henry's fault. Henry made the right choice. You know, it was a tactical decision. Um, that was just really interesting to me. And I kind of feel that this guy, uh, Engorand de Monstrelet, would definitely seize upon anything to, uh, to paint Henry as the bad guy. And he just doesn't. He lays the blame firmly at the feet of the French guys who were attacking from behind uh, and put Henry into that difficult position. Well, why is this interesting? Well, 
it definitely does point to the fact that there is kind of this strange chivalric thing going on in medieval Europe at this time. A lot of people um, nowadays will say, oh, you know, chivalry was never really a thing. It didn't really, uh, it didn't really happen. But it seems that sh the idea of chivalry that we have that might be more of a Victorian or 19th century idea of what chivalry should be isn't quite the same as what actual medieval chivalry was but there were definitely rules to it and they might not make quite sen a huge amount of sense to us but they were definitely there these guys did something wrong they were punished for it it wasn't necessarily something that we would consider wrong and actually Henry's chivalry was not questioned by the act that he did that we would definitely consider wrong so yeah I just found this really interesting when I was researching this. Um, so what do you think about it? Is this, is this an a, a example of our idea of chivalry not matching up with the medieval idea of chivalry? Or is there something else going on here? Um, I'd love to hear your comments. Please do leave them down below. Uh, if you want to come over and help me out, then you can head over to my Patreon and, uh, um, and join in over there uh, takes part in votes as to my next topic and things like that if you'd rather not then do leave a like do share uh, this video and if you're not already then please do subscribe those things mean an awful lot to me I am aiming for 3,000 subscribers by Christmas so let's see if we can do that thanks very much guys and I'll see you in my next video bye bye